Gareth. Hey, Gareth. Hey, Gareth. All right, so we're going by a couple of folks here. Great. Wonderful. Welcome to everyone. All right. Well, it's um, 401. So I think we'll get started here for those who are uh, have already joined us, and I'm sure we might get a few more along the way. Uh, we will be recording this and then posting it on our YouTube channel as well as on our web page. Uh, so it will be accessible for those who couldn't make it. And also, if you do need to leave early, uh, you can finish it at a later time on one of those uh, areas. So uh, without further ado, my name is Gareth Jones. I'm the Assistant Director in the Office of Service Learning and Undergraduate Research. And this is the grand finale of our undergraduate workshop series, the third that we've offered through Zoom. Uh, this is probably, I don't know, the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth time <laughs> that we've had Dr. Bullard come and talk to undergraduates about getting ready for grad school. He brings a wealth of information and experience to this, uh, it, both working for the graduate school, working as a professor in genetics, with his own daughter recently. <laughs> He's got tons of experience and lots of great advice. So um, we're going to go ahead and hand over the time now to Dr. Bullard. And uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate everyone being here. Right. Well, thanks, Gareth. I'm going to try to attempt to share my slides here. Um, this is the first time I've ever given this talk in my basement. I can guarantee you that. And also the first time I've ever done it by Zoom. So um, thanks to everybody who's uh, joining today. And if if you have any questions at any time during my talk, feel free to uh, raise your hand, do whatever, or just interrupt me, and I'd be happy to, to answer your question. You don't have to wait till the end, but we will have time at the end to, uh, to really answer anything that you might have. So um, let me see if I can get this away from my screen. So my talk today is going to focus on how you can prepare and apply, um, really prepare now and, and, and eventually apply for biomedical PhD programs, but it isn't, what I'm going to say isn't restricted to just biomedical programs. Uh, this would apply for engineering, for example, a lot of different STEM fields. And there may be some differences, for example, if you want to apply to PhD programs in history or other humanities or th things like that. There's a lot of commonalities, but we'll focus primarily today on, on more biomedical, so biology, chemistry, biomedical engineering, really anything in the medical sciences. So um, I've been here since 1996. I'm in the Department of Genetics and more recently in the graduate school since 2016. And I've given this talk, as Gareth kind of mentioned, at many different forums. I really enjoy it. Uh, and a lot of things that I'm gonna talk about were actually um, maybe probably best term mistakes that I made way back when I applied to graduate school in the mid to, to later 1980s. So I think the first question really is, why should I be interested in applying to a graduate program in a science-related field? This is, of course, a personal question. You really have to answer this for yourself. You may be interested in doing research work. This is certainly very important, the reason why I went uh, and ahead and applied to graduate school. Perhaps you're interested in, a, in an academic career, being a professor like me, or some of the professors that you have from your classes. You may not be interested in working in academia, but perhaps in industry or for biotech companies, and also a government agency. And you can probably see really anywhere on the news right now that there's a lot of scientists working at NIH, CDC, and other places to try to control the pandemic. Um, you may be primarily, primarily interested in teaching in a university and not really doing much research. But for the most part, as I'll talk a little bit later, uh, you'll have to get a PhD if you want to get a job at, at a place like UAB. You also may be considering at this point or may become interested later on in a career in science policy or in science writing. Uh, there's a lot of new careers that are coming on, uh, on board here. Um, new careers really are, are you know, developed almost every year, so it's hard to say in the next 10 years what some of the careers might be uh, in related to biomedical sciences. It's an important question that I get asked a lot, and it is a really good question. Do I need to get a PhD to accomplish my goal? So I'm giving you a very vague answer here. Yes and no. So what do I mean by that? Um, let me move my screen a little bit more. It really depends on the type of position that you want. So my suggestion with whatever field you're interested in, um, talk to individuals working in your field of interest, some professors, 
uh, say in the biology department or the genetics department like me or people that went through graduate school and say, this is what I'm interested in. Um, do you think I need to go to graduate school and get a PhD to do this? Um, you can also look on the web. There's a lot of information related to this question. You guys have the advantage that I didn't back in the mid 1980s. There was no internet. Um, that's how old I am. So uh, you really have that at your disposal and I'd really strongly encourage you just to start Googling various things about careers and find out really what the training path is that you need to do in order to uh, attain those future goals. So if you are going to choose a PhD, it's a, I won't kid you, it's a long process. In general, most of the time, at least in the biomedical world, you're going to spend about five to six years in graduate school. Uh, depending on what you want to do, what type of career, you might have to do a postdoctoral fellowship, which the easiest way to explain that is another opportunity for you to do research much more independently. You'll still have a mentor, but you'll be expected to kind of develop your project, oversee your project. You might oversee some graduate students and other personnel, but really uh, another opportunity for you to get uh, more experience in research and then also potentially writing things like fellowships and even getting some experience writing grants. After that, um, hopefully you're ready for your first real job. It could be, uh, if you're not doing a, a postdoctoral fellowship, maybe six years, but if you are, it may be 10. So I always like to tell people that I didn't get my first real job, my, my job here at UAB until about 10 years after I um, graduated from undergrad. So another important question, is it worth the time and effort? Once again, it's, this is individual question. You have to answer this for yourself. Um, you may think, and this is actually something that, that's really important because uh, if you're going to school here at UAB, um, you can do research as a physician, you can do research as a dentist. Uh, if you go to Auburn, we have plenty of researchers who are veterinarians. We have at UAB physical therapists, optometrists, you name it, anybody in the health related field, a lot of people are doing research and that's why they really come to UAB. You don't necessarily need to get a PhD but you're probably gonna to have to get one of these other career, uh, degrees and uh, you won't be immediately ready to do research. You'll probably have to do a fellowship or something else. And that's really what the point is there at the bullet point in red. Um, if you wanna be competitive for getting research grants, you have to have documented research training, uh, first author papers, things like that. So if you're gonna get a, a, a kind of a clinical degree, you'll still have to probably do a fellowship in research. You can also take other paths. Uh, you can do an MD, PhD. You can do a veterinary PhD to combined uh, program, or even here at UAB, you can do a dentistry and, and PhD program. These are a lot longer programs. They generally take, uh, in some cases, I'm on the MD PhD committee here at UAB. They take probably about eight to nine years to complete both of them. And you'll still have to do a residency, but it kind of gives you the best of both worlds um, and would make you very competitive for getting a job at a place like, like UAB or Vanderbilt or Emory or other places that are, that are medical centers and universities uh, that are together. Um, another reason for doing this, if you still wanted to see patients, of course, and your patients may be animals, but uh, if you're a veterinarian, but it's, uh, it's kind of a combined career, if you will, seeing patients, treating patients, and then doing research. So what kind of things can you do right now um, even if you're an advanced student, I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, often get asked, what, what should my major be? Well, I think for the most part, um, I would advise you to get a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in anything such as biology, chemistry, biochemistry, physics. UAB now has a lot of different majors. Of course, we have a genetics major, neuroscience. Those would all be good. And I recommend the BS degree because in general, you have uh, more STEM-like classes, which are going to be important for the admission processes. Uh, we do have an occasion where um, a student has a BA degree. I had a student, I used to run the graduate program in genetics for seven years, and one of our best students who just graduated last December was a music major, but took science courses on the side. So you can do that. It's a little bit harder. You're going to have to take a lot more classes, but uh, it is still possible to uh, get a degree outside of science um, and still be competitive for graduate school. So one of the things that you really should, you know, start looking into right now, 
especially if you're a freshman, sophomore, and, and you can still, um, you know, take some elective type classes is you should really kind of prepare a list of what classes you need to take right now before you get to your senior year. And I can't stress this enough. And, I, and I'll give you an example. When I applied to graduate school, uh, the program I ended up going to a, a place called Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. It's, it's a lot of like UAB. It's a medical center university. Um, they said they would accept me. Uh, this was in March of my senior year, my last semester, but said I had not taken enough calculus. I was a semester short and then I would have to do this before I could start graduate school. Well, this is pretty difficult you can imagine because I was two months away from graduating. So I had to take a couple summer classes in order to get into graduate school. So don't be like me, make sure that you know exactly what you have to take depending on the program you're interested in. Um, this can be simply done by checking into different graduate programs on the web right now. I didn't have that advantage. Uh, but that information will be there. Make sure you know well before your senior year what classes you will have to take to be competitive before it's too late. You can also talk to your advisor, as I mentioned, other professors, the graduate directors, admissions counselors, things like that. Just, just do it early. Um, often get asked, what should my GPA be? And I think the easiest way I can explain this is try to avoid the C's when possible. Uh, I did have two C's when I was an undergrad and I got in, um, one in organic chemistry. I don't remember what the other one was in, but I think the key is, is to try to maintain as strong a GPA as you can. And really admissions committees are going to look at your grades and your science type classes. So um, there was a number of times where people would apply to the genetics graduate program and have an okay GPA. And when I went back and looked at their classes, it seemed like they did very well in their, um, non-science classes, but not so well in their science classes. And so that was uh, certainly wouldn't, you know, make the admissions committee um, be very enthused about that applicant. So do the best you can, try to get A's and B's. I would say that most, in most cases, graduate PhD programs in biomedical sciences are looking for GPAs above a 3233. Um, I can't speak for every admissions committee in the country, but try your best to get a 33 or above and if you don't have that, there's always options for masters. And I think I have a slide on that at the end. I did add one bullet point here at the end. I got asked this question today. So um, a student was interested to, to find out if it was okay to choose a pass fail grade for any of their classes this semester. If that potentially, if they elected to just do the pass, whether that might hurt their chances of getting into graduate school. So I can only really give you my opinion on this. I think really all admissions committees in the near future are going to understand what happened in the spring of 2020. And they're going to know that there were challenges for everybody, students and professors um, to do well in their classes or even professors to, to do the you know, same type of presentations and, and cover the same kind of material they did in the past. So I would say, and this is really just my opinion, that if you're going to get an A or a B in one of your science classes, something that might be important for graduate school, I would go ahead and take that. If you're getting a C or even a D and that's passing, I, I would choose probably the pass fail. Um, I would hope that admissions committees wouldn't, you know, ask you in an interview, well, why did you take a, you know, get a pass in that science class? You know, why didn't you do a grade? I would hope they wouldn't do that. I can't guarantee that. But I think that would probably be my general rule of thumb, A or B, I would take the grade, uh, C or D, I would probably take the pass. Um, and we can talk about that more at the end if you'd like. So one of the key things that you need to do in order to be competitive for getting into a PhD program is research experience. And I can't stress this enough. Um, it's, it's probably one of the most important things that a com admissions committee looks at. So often get asked is why do I need research experience to get into graduate school? Wouldn't I just uh, um, get the training while I was there uh, in um, each year? And, and cer certainly you're gonna get training. That's what graduate school is all about. But really the answer I give people is um, it's very difficult for admissions committees to really know whether um, you, know, you love science enough that you're gonna be committed to staying uh, through the kind of the, the hills and the valleys if you will in graduate school and get your PhD. And if you do research, certainly it's gonna help. You're gonna have some experience, but you won't have experience at all the different techniques since possible. There's too many of those now. It's really more that you, you did um, 
research, not in a lab class. And you came out of that going, I really love science. This is what I want to do. And, and that's really important for you to get um, that point across in your application and also during interviews. That's probably, in my opinion, the most important reason why you do undergraduate research is to come out of that experience and say, I love science. I want to go to graduate school. I want to get a PhD and I'm willing to do whatever it takes, you know, to do that. That's what programs really want to hear. Um, a lot of things happening right now with the GRE. So I'm hoping everybody has heard of this. Um, it is the standardized test that you take for most graduate programs these days. Uh, it's kind of the requirements for it though are changing. Uh, they've been changing over the last few years in the biomedical fields. Uh, it's different in engineering and different in, in some um, in psychology and things like that. Most of the biomedical programs around the country are no longer requiring the GRE, which is, I, I think it's a great thing. I don't think the GRE, to be honest, is very representative of, of your ability to succeed in graduate school. And so I'm happy about that. Uh, there's a lot going on now um, at this moment. So UAB graduate school, most of the programs have decided to waive the requirement for the GRE for applications over the next couple semesters. And this is happening at a lot of universities nationwide. So if you are a rising senior and you're interested in applying to graduate school, make sure you, I would say probably every two weeks uh, for the next few months uh, for the programs you're interested in, monitor their websites or send them emails and find out if it's required for you to take the GRE. Um, it, you know, GRE costs about 225 bucks. You gotta prepare for months to do this. It's a lot like if you remember doing the ACT or PSAT I would advise you if you don't need to take it, I would not. Um, but make sure you know if your if your program you know hasn't already waived this for you know several year in the last several years, that find out if they're waiving it for um, fall of 2021 admissions, which is when uh, you be if you're applying this fall, what you what you'd be entering in the fall of 2021. Uh, if you have to take the GRE, uh, uh, it has three different sections: a verbal, a section which uh, be, you know, uh, knowing the definitions of words that you probably never heard of. Um, at least I didn't know most of them. Uh, it'd be grammar, it'll be um, writing, things like that, uh, assessing uh, what the major points of, of certain passages would be. Quantitative is going to be largely the math part, but it's not going to be calculus. It's going to be a lot of stuff that you learned in middle school and early high school, things that most students, including myself, forget. Um, and the final section is actually an ethical writing. You'll be given a prompt and you'll have, um, I don't remember how long exactly, but you'll have a, a short period of time to write uh, kind of uh, uh, your points. Uh, you, you usually take, you're given a position you, and justifying your position. And that analytical writing is actually graded subjectively by people. And if you actually read the information that goes out, they tend to read, tend to review these in one to two minutes, which is pretty amazing that, uh, uh, and then they give you a subjective score. So I always tell, try to tell students to shoot for a combined score of about 310 or more. This is done through the, your scores in the verbal and quantitative sections. And for the analytical writing score, which is, as I mentioned, a subjective test, um, it's graded zero to five. Um, so I would usually try to shoot for a four or higher for this. Very important, I can't stress this enough, practice as much as you can. Um, in general, I, I would not, you know, encourage you to spend a lot of money on a, on a course that's going to cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, I think you can buy the practice books. You can get a lot of these in the bookstore or you can get them on Amazon, even potentially even cheaper. Get the books that have practice tests and time yourself. Um, that's one of the biggest problems that I see with students have taken this. They say, I didn't have enough time to finish. So do the practice test. Do it all at once. Don't just do it, you know, one section and take a break. Do it like, your, like it would be a real GRE exam. Time yourself. Buy several books. Do several practice tests. The um, Educational Testing Services Company, which offers the GRE, they actually have some free online tests when you sign up on their website. Can't stress it enough. There's also uh, an online program called Magoosh, which is um, kind of trains you by video. So if you're much more... Um, like uh, Gareth and you like film, um, <laughs> you can do it. I've, I've known some students have done this. I think it's about, uh, I looked maybe $175 for a six month subscription, if I remember correctly. 
but just go online and find out. They also have practice tests. Whatever way works best for you, I would spend three or more months preparing for the GRE if you have to take it because um, you don't want to have to take it more than once. If you do, you know, it's possible to once again, I'd spend several months preparing in between the, the first and the second test. All right, so how do you find graduate programs that are in your area of interest? Um, once again, uh, make, you know, con contact with the various people around you, uh, go to the websites, ask maybe some of the graduate students and postdocs that might be in your research labs, ask what they, uh, what places they looked into, what their thoughts were, maybe they even interviewed at some of those places so you can get their advice. Um, I would recommend that you, if you're going to go into uh, biomedical PhD programs that you think about applying to seven to 10. Um, don't just apply to one, that's not a good practice because most of the time you don't know how many slots they're trying to fill. And if they took a lot of graduate students, perhaps the year before, maybe they're taking fewer this year, they won't tell you that in general. You also wanna to apply to some schools that you think are gonna be very difficult to get in, maybe the Harvards and places like that if you're interested in their programs. And then maybe um, a few kind of mid-range schools you're pretty confident you can get into. And then maybe two or three safety schools, that's a good idea. So really the whole important thing is at the end of the whole process, you have a place where you can go, you've been accepted and can go ahead and get your PhD. So let me talk briefly about the application process. Um, this is extremely important. Um, you can make or break yourself by your application. Um, one of the things, and I, I shouldn't have to say this, but I do, make sure you fill the forms out correctly and completely. In a lot of cases, we'll see incomplete applications and a lot of programs won't even review your application until it is complete. Um, know that the application will probably be different for each program. So it won't be just one that you can do and then send the same thing in to all the different schools you're applying to. Um, make sure you get all of the different documents you're gonna need, transcripts, if you'd have to do the jury or scores, letters of recommendation, everything else that you need to do, make sure you have all of that together and then it's in on time because as I mentioned, any one of these things that aren't turned in, you may lose a chance to, to get considered and possibly get an interview. I would highly encourage you to get your applications in early. Most of the graduate programs that I know of in the biomedical sciences, PhD, their deadlines are around December 1st, maybe December 15th. These deadlines have been moving, moving earlier and earlier, almost on a yearly basis. And it's really an advantage for you to get your application in early as opposed to right on the deadline. We now uh, know of programs that are actually making interview invites well before their deadline. And you wanna be kind of in the early pile, I say, and not in the later pile, because perhaps you might miss out on a chance to get an interview. So get them in early. You don't have to get them in on September 1st, but I'd highly recommend you try to do this about a month in advance, maybe around November 1st. In my experience, it's the recommendation letters that usually take the longest to get in. It's because of professors are busy, as you know. I, I write lots of letter recommendations, so I appreciate when students remind me. Um, I would start early, maybe if you're gonna apply in the fall semester, first uh, week or two of the semester, I would ask professors if they're willing to do this, provide them with all the materials, kind of let them know what's coming. They'll get it. Usually these are done by email now. They get an email prompt and they go to a website and you upload a letter, but start talking to them, find out if they're willing to do that, and then give them plenty of time to do this so they, those letters can be in, because missions committees are really gonna look at those letters, especially uh, a letter from someone you did research for. Personal statement. Um, it may be called a few different things depending on the application, but this is really um, a short document where you describe why you wanna go to graduate school and get a PhD what you're really interested in in science. So I have read thousands of these. Um, I can tell you that it, it is critical. Um, there are a lot of things that you can, can kind of not do as well or do properly that can really hurt your chances. I think one of the biggest things is you have to come across as interested in science in graduate school. In a lot of cases, you read these and you go, I don't really know why they're applying. They just don't seem to be you know, that passionate about science. So make sure that that comes across because that's probably, you know, one of the three most critical things that will get your foot in the door at the graduate school is that you basically say, I want to do science, I love it, and this is what I want to do for my career. 
I always suggest to students to talk about your long-term career goals. You may change your mind and that's okay. And admissions committees know this, but talk about what you're thinking about, you know, what you'd like to do after you're done with your training. Do you want to work as a professor at an academic university? Are you interested potentially in going to industry? I wouldn't get too specific. In some cases, I, I've had people say, I want to work at Columbia University and Department of Genetics on this. That, that's a little bit too much. Um, you can have multiple interests. You can put that down, but I think it's important to talk about that. It's essential that you talk about your previous research experiences. So this is really where they're going to go, okay, this person has done some undergraduate research. Um, and describe what you've done. You know, talk about your project, what the goals were, uh, what some of the findings were. Um, also, I think it's important if you have any deficiencies, say you have a lower GPA or say you had a bad semester, something happened. Um, I think it's important to deal with that in your personal statement. You don't want to spend a lot of time on it. You don't want to write multiple paragraphs, but it is going to be noticed. And I think if you come out and just say, look, uh, probably the one I remember the, the best is a student who I uh, accepted into the genetics program, PhD program, who went to Auburn and didn't do very well his first uh, year in either semester and said, I um, got in a fraternity, I had too much fun and I realized this, so I quit the fraternity and you, his GPA and his grades did much better and, and that's okay because he was honest and he did something about it. So I think it's important to kind of bring that up. There is some area that, that you think that is gonna, you know, maybe be viewed as a little bit unfavorably to talk about it in your personal statement. Very important not to write a novel. I recommend no more than two pages. Don't do half inch margins and single space, you know, don't try to skirt the system, but I always view that a missions committee member might be looking at these on a Sunday night and have 50 applications that they have to review. So they're not gonna read five or six pages of this. They want you to get to the point, get there quickly. Um, you also don't wanna to provide too much personal information. So I've had instances where students have told me what type of medications they're on. That's absolutely not necessary. That's your business. Hopefully if you, you know, are, have a particular condition that you're, you're seeing the doctor and getting treated for that, but you don't need to provide that information in your personal statement. That, that's just not anybody's business but yours. And that sometimes can put some stigma on you as an applicant. So just avoid that. Um, hit on the main areas. Because you're only doing one to two pages, you probably have a paragraph to kind of introduce yourself and talk about your interest in science. Maybe a couple paragraphs to talk about your research experience. Um, maybe a paragraph for a deficiency. And then um, you know, maybe a last paragraph to talk about the particular program you're applying to. Also often get asked, you know, um, is it okay to, to list in a personal statement that the reason I want to go to graduate school is because I've had a you know, a person in my family have a particular disease and things like that. And, and I always try to tell students, this is okay to put down, and I see this a lot in personal statements, but it shouldn't be your only reason why you want to go to graduate school and become a scientist. Um, you know, want to make sure you're doing this for you and not just for somebody else. So it's honorable, I think, that you became interested in science, perhaps because a, a family member had a particular condition, but make sure that you are interested enough in science that, you know, you want to do this as a career because you, you love it. And, and that's really uh, something that you're very interested in. As I said, I think it's important uh, somewhere in the personal statement. I usually ask students to do at the end why you're applying to this specific program. Uh, too often we kind of see personal statements, which I call cookie, cookie cutter ones where, you know, they sent the same personal statement to every school. Uh, this will get noticed. So I think, you know, just a paragraph of what is it about that particular program that you like? What are some of the names uh, of professors and, and their work that you're interested in? Because this will usually give programs a pretty good idea of what area of science, even if you're applying to say to a neuroscience program, you know, there's a lot of different areas in neuroscience. So maybe a few names of professors, maybe three or four, you don't need any more. Um, that's really critical because that will personalize it and they'll say, you know, um, that person did their homework. You know, I think they're very interested in, and that will potentially get you an interview uh, unless if you don't do that, uh, much your chances will be decreased. 
And the last thing here is have a professor read your personal statement, your essay before submitting. Too often um, I see personal statements where I said to myself, I know that somebody who knew about graduate school, who maybe had been on an admissions committee before, at least, you know, was recently in graduate school, did not read this. There's too many things that weren't included. Um, there are spelling mistakes. Make sure you spell check. Uh, some of the sentences don't make sense. Have several people read this if at all possible, because if you write a poor personal statement, you're probably not going to get considered really anymore. It, it's going to be noticed. And when you're being compared to all those other applications, all those other applicants, uh, it's definitely going to stand out that it was a poor personal statement. So the letters of recommendation, they're critical. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, try and get at least one letter from a person that you did research work for, because they're gonna be the one, or maybe you have multiple, who can really comment on your potential to be a successful graduate student and be successful in research. So um, I always joke with students, often I see three letters, usually you have to do three letters from professors that you took classes for. So maybe your biology or chemistry course, something like that. And I joke with the students that I, I really don't expect that you're going to have a letter written from somebody you got a C in because you're going to choose the people with A's. So those are okay. But if all three of your letters are from professors who you just had for a class, they're not really going to comment on anything other than your academic performance. So try to get something from somebody that can talk about your research abilities. Um, so let's go to interview questions. So if you are fortunate to get invited to an interview, you've got to prepare. Um, you've got to practice. People often don't think you have to do this, but you're going to be very nervous. Um, you know, you've got to think about uh, answers to some of the common questions. You're going to get asked probably numerous times, why do you want to go to graduate school? Why are you interested in this particular area of science? And where do you see yourself, say, 10 years from now in your career? You should be able to answer these in your sleep. You should practice in front of a mirror. You should videotape yourself with audio answering these type of questions. That's really a good idea. When I tell that to students, they often say, no way, I'm not going to do that. That's really a good way for you to know how you come across, how you look, whether you're making good eye contact, things like that. I highly recommend that. Get one of your friends to give them sample questions, have them ask you those questions and see how you perform and do it in an environment where you know, you're not standing up, you're sitting, you're looking professional, you're facing the person. Uh, practice as often as you can. You're going to get asked to talk about your research that you did as an undergrad. Um, some of the things that are critical here. So I wrote down in red, don't just say that you did PCR. If you did PCR, that's fine. But why did you do PCR? What was the objective of the project? What was the hypothesis? Don't just talk about the techniques that you did but talk more about the whys. And that's gonna be critical because you get asked that in the interviews. And if you aren't able to, to really elaborate on what your objectives or purpose was, uh, that's gonna be um, considered kind of a downfall. Um, you might get asked if you understand really the training pathway that you need to do for you to obtain your future career goals. And, and I, I mentioned a postdoctoral fellowship earlier. I would say that probably somewhere between three and 5% of the people I interviewed when I asked that question, do you know what a postdoctoral fellowship was? So that's kind of a red flag, right? Because if you don't know, if you want to be a professor at UAB in the department of genetics, like I am and run your own research lab, there's no way you'll get that position unless you do a postdoctoral fellowship. So the fact that some of these individuals didn't even know about that isn't really a good sign. So that's why it's good to talk to graduate students, talk to professors, talk to postdocs, really find out what their experiences were like. So when you get asked that question, you can say, yes, I've talked to those individuals. I know what it's like. I know, you know, what, uh, what it's like working in a lab, you know, for five or more years. All right. Very important in interviews. Make sure you come across as enthusiastic and generally interested in science and the particular graduate program. So you may be saying, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. Why would you be even bringing this up? I have interviewed a number of people that basically sat there and gave just yes and no answers and couldn't elaborate at all. And that is really a warning sign. So make sure you're excited, you're enthusiastic, you don't need to be jumping up and down, uh, don't drink too much coffee beforehand, 
but you really need to come across as you have a genuine interest in science, you have plans, you're thinking about potential careers, you're enthusiastic, that's really important. You also need to ask questions. They will say, do you have any questions? If you don't, that's not gonna be good. So make sure you kind of do your homework beforehand. Um, I listed there in the third bullet point. Uh, usually you're given an itinerary about your interview. Sometimes they don't come, you know, maybe a day before the interview, but still spend some time to see if you can look up the professors you'll be meeting, the various people, jot down some questions about their work, and as I mentioned before, do as many practice interviews as you can. Uh, often get asked, what should I wear? Uh, I always say that you should look professional. So I can't really say for you what is a professional outfit, but um, look professional. I can say at least, uh, uh, I get asked a lot of times by um, some of the, the males, should I wear a tie? And my response is, if you feel comfortable wearing a tie, yes, but if you're gonna pull at it, if you're gonna you know, be scratching your neck all the time, I wouldn't do that. I just wear a sport coat, a dress shirt, and dress pants, and dress shoes. So um, just look professional. Um, kind of the joke that we have is don't look like you're going out to the club. Um, that's kind of a good thing not to do. Um, there may be receptions and things at the interview. A lot of times they'll do these as big groups. Sometimes alcohol is provided, and if you're 21, um, should you drink? Well, that's kind of a personal question if you are. Uh, going to you know, consume alcohol, make sure you don't consume too much. Uh, I've been at a number of receptions where some of the um, applicants, I think, had too much to drink and that came across as very negative. So it's okay if you're 21 uh, to have maybe a drink. Uh, you, kinda, you should know your limits if you do drink alcohol, but don't overdo it. Set as many alarms as necessary. Uh, we've had several students at our interviews in the past that have overslept. Uh, I don't need to tell you how that was perceived. Um, you have phones, you can get wake up calls, you can bring alarms, whatever you need to do, make sure you're ready. And wherever you're supposed to be, make sure you're there five to 10 minutes in advance. When you're at an interview, talk to the current students. They're often your best sources of information. They'll kind of tell you the, what really happens in the program. Uh, my advice there is not just ask one student. I get multiple opinions. Sometimes you can find somebody who's a little bit unhappy with their program. And if you listen to them too much, you might say, oh, I don't wanna go there. Talk to a bunch of them, kind of get a good uh, lay of the land, if you will, and see whether that might be a place you might wanna go if you get an offer. Um, if you are a more you know, senior student, meaning your, your third or even you know, junior or senior right now, and you've kind of decided late to go to graduate school, there are things you can still do. Um, you can take a gap year I don't really have time to talk a lot about this, but you could do a master's. A plan one master's is a research-based master's, generally takes longer, maybe a year and a half. Uh, plan two is, is usually a course-based master's. Uh, you still be able to do some research on that. That's usually 30 credits and takes about a year. Those are good things that you can do to get your GPA up if your GPA is low. Most master's programs have a 3.0 GPA requirement to get in. I would suggest that you're probably not gonna get into a PhD program in the biomedical sciences if you have a, a GPA under a 3.0. I just don't think that happens very often. I'm not saying it's impossible, but if you um, need to improve your GPA, I'd highly recommend doing a master's. If there's any way you can continue to do research as part of that master's, that's a good idea. If you don't wanna do a complete master's, you can take classes even at the master's level usually as a non-degree seeking student. So let's say that you took an immunology class and you didn't do very well, you could take a master's level immunology class and hopefully you know, get an A or a B and show that admissions committee that, that you know, that was just an anomaly and that you are very good in immunology, especially if you're applying to an immunology program. You could, if you need more research experience, let's say you have very little, maybe you don't even have any research experience, you can do this as a volunteer. I know it's hard to afford to live in some cases, but um, it's harder to get the paid positions for research so volunteering is a good idea. You could potentially get a job as a research technician. Some of these are available. Um, they do sometimes hire people without any experience, but it's a little bit harder, but definitely something you could look into. There's also a number of programs that we have one here called the Prep Scholars. It's a post-baccalaureate program. Uh, myself and Dr. Gavin run the Prep Scholars program. It's a year-long program sponsored by NIH where you actually get paid a stipend, 27,200. 27, 
uh, and you get tuition and also health insurance. And you spend a year working in a research laboratory and also taking a small number of classes and getting professional development help from Dr. Gavin and I, especially with applications, interview strategies and things like that. There's about 36 or 37 programs throughout the country. There are other post-bac programs you can do as well. But if you're thinking about a gap year, um, look into these. They do have eligibility requirements. Um, you'd be either, either being an underrepresented minority or a person with a disability or what NIH refers to as economically disadvantaged, which has a lot of different categories. So make sure you're eligible first before you apply. But these can be some good strategies you can do to kind of increase your competitiveness for graduate school. So I'm gonna end there and, and take the next whatever time to um, answer anybody's questions. Um, I don't know, Gary, if you wanna moderate this or. Sure thing, uh, let's see. Uh, don't see any messages in the chat, uh, but we do still have a few people. Does anyone have any specific questions for uh, Dr. Bullard? All right, not at this time, it seemed like. But, uh, well, I'd be curious, Gareth, if everybody could just, that's on, could just talk about what potential programs they're interested in. I'd be curious. If you did too wrong, if you don't mind, you could tell uh, what you're interested in uh, pursuing, and he might be able to give you some specific Anybody want to? Be the first. <laughs> hey, Dan, I just wanted to hear what you had to say and kind of the advice you were sharing. So I really appreciated your session. It was really good. You can still apply, Melissa, to a program. You know, there's time. Never too old to learn, right? I didn't, I didn't say anything about age. I'm not going there. Uh, and we can, we can, how about Abby? What are you interested in? Say that again. I'm asking Abby. Uh, <laughs> hello. Um, so I'm actually a American in the office with Gareth. Um, okay. I got my undergrad in music education. And so I just decided to take a gap year and do the AmeriCorps program. Okay. Um, I'm, we'll say that I'm not, a, I didn't really take many science or math classes during undergrad. Um, it is something that's very interesting to me, but I will will say that I'm I'm not really a um, math brained person. <laughs> okay. Are you interested in any um, programs in the humanities or other social sciences or? Um, I honestly haven't given much thought to it. Um, after your talk, it is something that I would be interested in. Um, I've been kind of thinking about doing um, uh, music therapy, so maybe like a like a something in psychology, maybe. Um, but I haven't really looked into any programs um, yet um, to deal with that. Yeah, so psychology programs. Um, there's a lot of different flavors. UAB has uh, behavioral neuroscience, clinical and medical psychology, and also lifespan and developmental um, psychology. But uh, if you're gonna do a PhD, I would definitely uh, try to get research experience. That's gonna be important. Um, maybe not so much for a master's program, but uh, you know, there are opportunities for research here at UAB. There's a lot of uh, investigators, not just in the psychology um, department, but at other places as well. So you might be able to get some opportunities, uh, you know, as I mentioned, even as a volunteer, uh, if you're interested. What would you have to say for someone who maybe um, has like some gaps in their schooling or maybe kind of decided later? Because um, I, I had a, a 3.5 GPA in school in, in the music area, but if I were wanted to go back and take some more science, like post back science classes to kind of get that under my belt and maybe apply to some kind of program. Um, but I kind of have that gap of maybe doing AmeriCorps or working. Is that something um, that is a deterrent to people that look at your application? So I would say that um, it's much more common now to see um, applications from people who have not applied directly after college. 
uh, I don't want to call it older, um, just but people who maybe went out in the workforce or did some of the things you talked about. I've seen a lot more of that. And I think in a lot of cases, as long as the rest of the application, you know, is good. Um, I think admissions committees like that because they know somebody is, is, you know, at least has a lot more life experience, maybe a little bit more mature, um, a little bit more committed in some cases, knows, you know, knows what they want. So I think we're seeing a lot of that now and, and a lot of different, uh, especially really either master's or PhD programs. So I, I don't think it would be a, a liability at all, just as long as you had whatever qualifications you needed for that particular field. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Rowan. I was, just gonna, oh, I was gonna add just a couple of things real quick to what I talked about and what she's doing and push the other half of our office, which is service learning and how it crosses over very nicely to a lot of the things that you were talking about. <coughs> so she was talking about music therapy and our office builds relationships with nonprofits in the, the Birmingham community, even statewide. And very often those experiences can start off as a service learning course or a, uh, an internship or something that, that, like that, but that can give you experience and research experience. For example, uh, the Kaaba uh, Riverkeeper, the, the, and they, in fact, just nobody was our keynote speaker for our expo. They have some incredible internship opportunities. And we have that collaboration with them through UAB, but that definitely you can do active research with a service learning partner as well. So that's another creative way that you can enhance your, uh, your personal statement and your experience level. Yeah, that's great advice, Gareth. And Andy, I would say for you, maybe we can find a good partner that is with musical therapy. Uh, I think there are some, you know, that's the thing you get with that and find that. And, uh, you know, I'll throw out one other name here, Adjacent Space. I teach a class on disabilities in film. And one of uh, the students in my class has made this connection with the, that nonprofit that helps provide uh, ASL and uh, sign language interpretation for different events around Birmingham and they're trying to raise awareness for that. She's actually now doing some active research for them and survey or things like that. So it's amazing how you can combine these things, especially if it's something you're passionate about. And it can be useful into a personal statement and really show them that yes, you you maybe got interested in something for one reason, but then you got involved with it and your passion really led you in that direction. So yeah, maybe you have a relative who is deaf and you think, well, yeah, I'm going to learn ASL, but suddenly you start doing this research with this other group and you're like, oh my goodness, this is really interesting. This is something I could see in my career uh, going in that direction. So Abby, we can talk about that <laughs> off, of, uh, off of this, but other students as well. It's amazing how, taking advantage of those opportunities as an undergraduate. And even during the time where we are in separate areas, there are ways that you can do research now that uh, are, can be really helpful to a community partner, uh, that providing services or not, things like that. So, you know, even though you're not on campus, there's ways to still continue what you're doing. Uh, Rowan, do you want to tell us what you're interested in? Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm interested in the pathology program, in the pathology program theology program. So I did a master's degree in 2018 in biotechnology and I graduated from it and now I'm working in research as a gap year student. Okay, did you say um, physiology or histology? Physiology. Okay, physiology. So you thinking about a PhD or not? Yes. Okay, um, when are you thinking about applying? Uh, so I actually applied last year, but I couldn't get in this year. So now I'm thinking, should I, should I apply again in the same program? Which, which program was it exactly? It was under the biomedical science program. So the G GBS program? Yeah. Okay, why don't you uh, send me an email and maybe we can talk about it. I can, if you're okay, I can, I can access your application and take a look at it. Um, did you ever reach out to the directors about 
your application to see if they had any uh, things, comments that, that would help you or not? No, no I just uh, saw my decision. Yeah, that would be, uh, that's a good idea, I think. Uh, reach out to the program director. Dr. Snyder is in the graduate school. I know him very well. But also, if, you know, I, can, I can take a look at it, too, if you'd like. Just send me an email, and uh, um, we can maybe set up a time to talk. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, no problem. Thank you. So, All right. I think everyone else is left here. Uh, and Cliff Holsey, who's joined us. <laughs> We've got James, Jimmy Grimes. Yeah, everyone else here is a staff. So, but I just want to thank you again, Dan. Uh, it's a pleasure listening to you talk about these things. I learn new things every time you talk about it. And uh, I am so grateful for you doing this during this crazy time. Uh, but again, to everyone else, we've recorded it. We will put it up on our social media, on our website. Uh, you email us, we'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, we'll have an MP4 of it. So uh, thanks again to everyone who joined us. We uh, kind of fluctuated there, but uh, we had some good numbers there for a little bit. So thanks uh, to everyone for joining us. And thanks, Abby, for coordinating. All right. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Have a good day. Bye.